Okay, so let's start today's lecture. <clears throat> so for today, uh, we're going to continue um, watching the remaining videos that's left from last week. Uh, so basically, in this edX course, we'll finish module four. Uh, <clears throat> that includes video 4.4, 4.5, and 4.7. Um, and then once we finish the video, I will uh, give some remarks. And once we're done with that, uh, we will have a second uh, practice session. Uh, I will first show you how to set up the environment and get the practice going. Uh, once that's done, we will move over to uh, Google Meet uh, so that if you have any questions, uh, you can share it there. Um, <coughs> All right, so let's start with the videos. So our first stop is going to be to talk a little more in detail about this idea of RESTful routes that in Rails we've just kept sort of pointing at this file called routes.rb. Like what's going on there? And as a reminder, where are we in our, our big uh, you know, view from 10,000 feet? We have gone down from the app server down into the level of the models, views, and controllers. And we're going to be talking about routes, which are most closely associated with controllers. So that's going to be our first stop. And our second stop today, once we finish, is we're going to talk about the models and the database. So here are some things that you've seen before. Uh, what you've seen before is the stuff on the bottom. Um, here are the sort of standard five RESTful routes for any kind of a resource. As a reminder, the four basic things you do on a resource are you can create it, read it, update it, and delete it. And there's usually one additional RESTful action, which is give me back a list of all of the instances of that resource, possibly with some filtering. So routes like this you have seen before. We saw routes like this when we constructed them manually uh, in apps like our Sinatra app. What's on top is the way that these routes would appear in the routes.rb file. Uh, so you can see that the syntax, and by the way, uh, in terms of parentheses and things like that, um, what is, how would I parse this? Because this is actually just plain Ruby code. This isn't like a special format or, or embedded language for this file. This is just plain Ruby. So how would I parse this? What kind of a thing is get in this case? Just like it was in Sinatra, right? Get is just a function, right? And because I have not parenthesized aggressively, uh, if you can imagine, I wish I had a thing where I could draw on the screen. Does PowerPoint let you do that? <gasps> what do I do? That's never going to work. Where's the, there is no pencil. Oh. Is it one of these things? Oh, there, OK. It's, sorry, it's hard. it doesn't show up on my screen, so. OK, so let's see. I'm going to screw this up, but. Mm, uh, all right, whatever. <laughs> um, if you can imagine an opening left parentheses right after get, and the closing parentheses is going to be where? On, where on that line would I expect to close, close paren? Not a trick question. All the way at the end. So get is a function that apparently in this case takes how many arguments? Really? Is it really two? Is it really three? Why isn't it one? Let me rephrase that. It's one. Why is it one? <laughs> what is the single argument that get seems to expect? It's a hash. It's a hash with two key value pairs. The first key is the string uh, slash movies, and its value is movies hash index. The second key is the symbol as, and the value of that key is the string movies. Okay? 
again, a, a, the, our goal is to understand how routes generally work, but again, I want you to understand that this is just plain Ruby code. This is not like a special secret separate language or anything like that. Okay? So get, post, put, and delete are just Ruby functions that take a single argument, which is basically a hash describing what this route should map to. Right? So these are sort of the standard, uh, you know, by convention, if you look at zillions of Ruby apps, this is by and large how those apps choose to name their routes. They have controller actions called index, new, create, et cetera, et cetera. They have routes that look very much like this to map to those actions. And in a moment, I'm sh I'll show you what the as is for. It lets you basically, uh, it lets Ruby generate a function for you that will return the built version of that route. Let me pause for a moment and take some questions because there clearly are some. This, this is subtle, so I want to make sure that people are, are comfortable with it. So great time to ask a question. All questions are good. No? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it that you're still with me. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things here that maybe look a little different from the RESTful routes we've been talking about so far. For example, uh, we could probably agree that index and create are certainly part of the sort of standard RESTful routes, but new doesn't look like something we've seen before, nor does edit. So a question is, what are those actions doing in there? Why do we need a new action as well as a create action? And why do we need edit as well as update? They're sort of paired up that way, and they're paired up for a reason. And here's a hint. In terms of your API, if you were creating a movie, you would probably be doing a post, and you would include along with that post what? Just yell it out. A form, You'd be some sort of data describing the thing that you want to have created. Um, but if we're now talking about an app that might be facing a human being, where would that information most likely be coming from? From somebody filling out a form in a browser, right? So. The create action is happy to accept a bunch of data saying, here is the thing to be created. But where did that data come from? In a human-facing app, it was probably entered by a human being somewhere. So you need a place where the human being can do that. And conventionally, that is an action called new, which serves a form that can be filled in. When the form is submitted, it will post to the create action, and the right thing will happen. Same thing with edit and update. You have an existing resource. You want to make changes to it. OK, but you need a way for a human being to specify what those changes are. By convention, the edit action will serve a form that shows what the values in the resource are now, allows changes to be made, and then when that form is submitted, it'll post to the update action. So that's why in a human-facing app, uh, in addition to the default RESTful routes, you will typically see other routes like new or like edit whose job is to serve the human being the current representation or a blank template that they can fill in, and then when they submit that, that's what triggers the action that causes the change to the resource on the server side. There was a question, sir. Uh, are these similar to like the anchor tags and HTML pages, which kind of redirect you to uh, see a section called create or slash show? Uh, we will see how the anchor tags in HTML map to the views that do this, if you'll give me a little bit of time to get there. And there was, yes. Excellent question. So why is it that things like create and update, which make changes, use post and put, but things like uh, new and edit are OK to use get? And I think your observation was exactly the right one. It's that new by itself doesn't actually change anything. It gives you a blank form to fill in. And if you submit the form, that would change it. Same thing with edit. Serving a representation of the resource that can be edited is not actually making any changes. It's just giving you the opportunity to submit the form and make changes. OK? Great. Yes, question. Um, what is the purpose of the, having the IDs when you want to do it in the Oh, it's a typo. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so the question was, in the route for making a uh, new movie, why do I need an ID? And yeah, you're right. If it's a new movie, it doesn't have an ID. That's called a typo. I'll fix it in real time. And uh, thanks to the magic of editing, uh, nobody in TV land will ever know that we did this. Ta -da. Um, which is a good lead into the next question that I was going to ask, which is basically, how come some of those routes have an ID wildcard character in them and other routes do not? 
what determines if the route should or shouldn't have that ID wildcard someplace in it? $50 question follow-up, if uh, whoever asked the question about new, if you want to take a whack at this one. Yes, yeah, so, exactly. So basically, an action that refers to a specific existing resource, you need a place in the route to name that resource somehow, and that's what the ID is. But some actions, like create, do not refer to an existing resource uh, because it hasn't been created yet. Uh, same thing with editing. Editing has to refer to an existing movie to edit, and when you post the, uh, or when you do the put to update it, you have to make sure to identify which thing you want to update. But on the other hand, an action like get uh, movies, the very top one, because you're asking to see a listing of all of them, again, you're not referring to a specific one, therefore you do not need to identify it with a wildcard. Okay? Why is the wildcard uh, ID instead of some other thing? Because that's a Rails convention. By convention in Rails, every resource has an, I an ID and it will appear in the default RESTful routes, that's how you're supposed to put it. In a moment, we will see what you get if you agree to that convention. Convention over configuration is always a bargain. If you agree to whatever the, your side of the bargain is, Rails gives you something in return. And in just a few minutes, I will show you what you get if you're willing to say, OK, I, I buy into this. This is how I'm going to make my default RESTful routes look for a Rails app, unless I have a really, really good reason to do otherwise. So what does it look like when we take a trip through a Rails app? Because we already saw a trip through a Sinatra app, right? The trip begins with Sinatra parsing the route and trying to match it to one of the routes in your app. Um, the code runs. And at the end of the code, whatever the last thing that was uh, executed in that function, that becomes the return value. We saw a simple case where you just return a string. We saw a more complicated case where you return an HTML page that has had some stuff interpolated into it. So what if we take that same journey, but a Rails app instead of Sinatra? What does that look like? So there's a couple of more steps. The first step still involves mapping the incoming route to some sort of an action. But in Rails, there's a separate piece of machinery that does just that. There's a whole separate file called routes.rb, and you specify at a pretty high level what you want those mappings to be. Why do you want a separate file just for that? Well, one example might be, if you remember again, going back to our RESTful APIs, uh, one of the common use patterns for a resource is you want to do at least four things on it. Create, read, update, delete. And maybe also index, where you list uh, the instances of the resource, maybe with some filtering. That pattern is so common that in Rails, you can put a single line in the routes file that says, please set up routes for me for all of those actions with one line, as opposed to having one route that you spell out in each, uh, for each case in your app. Um, just as with Sinatra, the controller action is the piece of code you write. Um, and any optional parameters from the URI will be handled. They'll be extracted for you and put into a nice hash. It even has the same name. Uh, just as in Sinatra, the code in the controller action will set up instance variables. And those instance variables can then be consumed by the views. So this is another example of that uh, uh, anti-orthodoxy of object orientation. Even though the views and the controllers are different classes, it is just convenient for the controller to be able to set variables that magically become available to the view. And that's what happens in Rails just as it does in Sinatra. Um, the controller action eventually renders a view. This is a phrase that we'll, we'll sort of hear a lot. So I want to spend a few seconds on what does it mean to render a view? Basically, what it means is because we're doing request reply, every interaction that does not actually crash the app has to result in something. The thing that it results in might be an HTML page. It might be a JSON data structure. It might be a redirect, which was an example that we saw in Tuesday's lecture where the response says, actually, restart a new request and go to this other path, this other URI instead. But generically, we say that the controller renders something. And that's how you know the app is that that, that interaction is finished. Um, the view could be any one of different, you know, it could be HTML, JSON, whatever. But rendering a view is generically what we say, OK, we're done. We're going to now present the result of what we did in some manner to send back to the client. So um, as an example, if we visited, uh, we're going to have like a little fake app that we're going to create using Rails called Rotten Potatoes. It's like the Rotten Tomatoes movie app, but much simpler. Um, we can imagine that. When we try to visit uh, a URI in our app, the first thing that happens is the routes file is consulted to see if there's a matching route. Hopefully, there is a matching route. And again, do not worry about writing this down. I'm giving you a high-level tour. All of this is explained in much more detail in the upcoming homeworks. 
But one of the routes might say, if you see a route of the form get uh, slash movie slash wildcard ID, that should map to the show function or the show action in the movies controller. Don't write this down, it is just an example, but I'm giving you a sense of what does the syntax look like for telling Rails how to do mappings from a route to the name of a function, a piece of code you write that is called when uh, that route is submitted. If we look inside the controller, here's an example of what that route might look like, the, or the action for that route might look like. First of all, where do we go? In the controller subdirectory, we go to movies controller. Why, how do we know it's movies controller? Because as we're going to show uh, in just a moment, one of the key ideas that permeates the framework for Rails is called convention over configuration. What it means is if you agree to name certain things in certain ways, um, then it'll be automatic to know what controller file goes with what model file, which views go with which controller, which database tables are associated with which models. We, all, we do it just by looking at the words. So because we, in this case, we explicitly mapped a route to a particular controller action, but what we'll find is that in Rails, just knowing what's in the route, Rails will automatically infer the correct name of the file. Now, what does that mean for you? It means if you choose to give the file a different name, now you have to do extra work, right? Because now you have gone against Rails' opinion of, hey, if you're going to have a resource called movies, let's name everything associated with that resource after the word movies. The movie file that, or the, the model file for movies will be called movie.rb. The controller file will be movies controller. The views will live in a subdirectory called views slash movies. The database table will be called movies. The things that help you make the view pretty will call the movies helper. Like everything is based on that word. That is Rails' opinion of the right way to do it. You can do it a different way, but as I said, most of those decisions were made because in the long run, your life will be easier if you can make it look that way. Okay, so just like in Sinatra, where we've got this nice hash that captures parameters that came from the URI. In this simple example, we're grabbing a parameter that we expect to be in the route called ID, and we're going to do something that, as we'll see, this is a database query. So this is the controller invoking the model saying, please call a method on the model that will look up information about this particular movie. Right? So this is sort of a, a peek into what a very simple uh, controller action in a Rails app might look like. Um, but notice here, here's the beginning of the controller action. Here's the end of the controller action. Where is the render? I just finished saying that every controller action has to end by rendering a view. It's got to somehow present the answer to the thing it computed. Right? In this case, the thing it computed is it got the details, presumably, for some specific movie. But where is the piece of code that says, OK, now package that up and render it somehow for the client to consume? Where is that piece of code? It is implicit. Because since the most common case in web apps uh, that are model view controller is when you finish doing something, you're going to return an HTML page that somehow represents that thing. If you say nothing, by default, Rails will assume, well, let's see, the thing is a movie, and the action that you just did was called show. That's the name of the function. So I'm going to look in the views subdirectory under movies for a template whose name begins with show, and I'm going to use the extensions on that template to figure out how to actually translate the whole thing to raw format. Let me say that again, because there's a lot of automation here, but it is for your own good. The controller, action, or the controller that we called is the movie's controller. And within that controller, the action we did on the movie is show, which is one of the CRUD actions, right? Find details for an instance. Therefore, at the end of the show action, because you have said nothing to the contrary, because you have not given me other instructions, I, Rails, will look for a template named the same way as the controller and whose file name matches the action. If I find one, I will use the extension stripping them off one by one to figure out how to convert it to something. In this case, starting from the right, the extension is Hamel. Hamel is like a very, very concise markup language that takes a lot of the brackets out of HTML. So the first thing Rails will do is say, OK, I'll find a Hamel translator. And the expectation is that once I run that Hamel translator, what I'll get out of it is HTML. OK, well, that's cool, because I know how to return HTML. That's a thing I can return to a browser legitimately. So at that point, I will wrap up that whole thing in an HTTP response, and back it goes. Okay. So this is yet another example of convention over configuration. We didn't have to give the name of the file. We didn't have, even have to say, render the file, because those things are the defaults, because they are such a common case. Happiness. 
until you forget that that's how it works, then sadness. OK, so convention over configuration, worth spending a few minutes on. Basically, if you're willing to adopt certain conventions, almost all of which are related to how you name things, then you never need to have separate code specifying what those mappings are. So as we showed in this example, um, if there's an action called show on a resource called movies, then the assumption made by Rails is that there is a class called movies controller, that that class is defined in a file called moviescontroller.rb, Oh, good, this works. And that that file should contain a Ruby function whose name matches the desired action. Right? So this is all without you actually having to set this up anywhere. Furthermore, by default, when that action finishes, Rails will look for a view called views slash movies, matches the controller, slash show, matches the name of the action, and as many suffixes as indicated all the preprocessors necessary to run it until it gets to something that it knows how to return. HTML, JSON, XML, something like that. Um, and by the way, within this template, I can have, just as with Sinatra, instance variables that were set up by the show method, and all those instance variables can be incorporated into the view. So that's the same machinery as we saw for Sinatra. It's just the decision of what to do and what files to look for has now all been automated. And again, you can override any of these things if you have a good reason, but if you're wanting to override them, that's a moment to ask yourself, if the designers of Rails through five major versions have converged on this as a good way to do things by default, what is special about my app that it doesn't fit this? Is it really that my app is not, you know, I need to sort of go outside the framework, which sometimes happens? Or is it that the way that I'm thinking about the design of my app maybe is not quite right? And that if I thought about the design differently, I would come up with a simpler design that drops really nicely into what the framework already gives me. Okay, this is one of the most important things that you sort of acquire as a software engineer. It's called a sense of taste. Sometimes you do have to step outside the framework because you need to do something a little bit differently. You need to go a little bit beyond what the framework does. It would be ridiculous if the framework captured every possible Rails app that anybody could ever write. But if you find yourself doing it a lot, you should be asking yourself, maybe it's not you, maybe it's me. OK. So this says that the show action in the movies controller class which is defined in the file moviescontroller.rb, renders the template view slash movies slash show dot whatever dot whatever. And this relies heavily on Ruby's ability to introspect and to do metaprogramming. So remember, if, if you've been following the sort of more advanced Ruby slides and videos that we did not have time to cover in lecture, um, Ruby knows how to ask uh, any object a question about itself. For example, it can ask an object, to what class do you belong? And if the class name is movies controller, Ruby can do a little string manipulation to say, OK, if I take out the part before controller, lowercase it, now I can construct the file name, the directory name, and all the other stuff just from that. So a lot of this relies very heavily on Ruby's ability to introspect an object and use the object's name to derive all kinds of other assumptions about where related things in the app uh, might live that have some connection to that object. Question, sir? Yes, yeah, so the, the, when, when I say that the uh, implicitly Ruby will render this particular view, that is the same as in our Sinatra app when we said herb and we gave a file name. We had to explicitly tell Sinatra, we want you to run the herb preprocessor, and here is the specific file to run it on. Rails basically makes those assumptions and does that thing by itself by default, unless we tell it to do otherwise. Right? So again, it's, the, the downside is it's very opinionated. If you don't do things its way, you have to do extra work to go around it. Whereas in Sinatra, it has no opinion. So whatever it is you want done, you have to be explicit about it. It's a trade-off. All right, so that's the first video. Uh, if you have a few com comments, uh, we can get to the last slide. <laughs> So um, I want us to spend a moment and think about um, this principle like convention over configuration. What are the pros and what are cons? Uh, just like I said, um, one important thing I want everybody in this course uh, to be able to do is to exercise your critical thinking. Um, although we make 
many recommendations over uh, this course on, the, um, on different stuff. Um, there's always, you know, different some cases that won't really fit uh, for the best practice. So, uh, like here, I want us to pause for a moment. Um, I want all of you to think about that. Is there certain certain use cases, um, or certain project or whatever uh, that may run into issues if we go with um, this convention over configuration principle? Um, or from the other perspective, is there certain uh, cases for for certain for certain uh, programmer or developer, uh, is there any uh, disadvantages um, by using uh, conventions over configuration? Um, okay, I'll pause for like half a minute and feel free to leave comments uh, and I will um, talk about that briefly. That's 30 seconds. Um, so one thing I would think of would be A, um, because it's convention over configuration, so it's very uh, opinionated, something already uh, mentioned by the professor. If you need to um, have some flexibility um, where it doesn't really follow along the convention, um, then you need extra, extra effort to work around that um, so which means basically that's extra effort uh, the pro is if you if you follow or if your application can follow this convention then it's great it saves a lot of effort uh, basically you can do the same amount of work uh, in a shorter time a shorter period of time um, Whereas on the other side, um, if you cannot follow the convention for whatever reason, or if the um, uh, the application you're building is not really that conventional, right? Like what I uh, one of the example I mentioned, like if I'm building an application that's a web-based real-time online game then the, the design pattern is actually different. The architecture is different. Um, so of course it will break the convention a lot. Um, here we're talking about something like MVC, you know, all that thing. So in that case, uh, if uh, the project that's being worked on really is not that conventional application or a conventional web application, uh, then Convention over configuration breaks, right? The 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 cons outweighs the pros, so um, that's one thing. Uh, so if that happens, let's say somehow you get to a project that's not that really conventional, um, which that probably means you should look for some other framework. Um, like I mentioned, um, in the online game project, I ended up using uh, Node, Express, and Socket IO, um, plus a state management uh, framework. So, um, so that's that. Um, and that the other issue with convention over configuration is that um, by saying convention, uh, we're saying basically 
uh, the program or the framework will be doing a lot of stuff implicitly, right? It, it automates many process. Uh, for example, um, if you look at code, you won't see something like require, import, include, which you often see in many other programming languages and many other um, web frameworks. Where, for example, you need to like include the controllers into uh, the router. And then you need to include the view into the controller. Um, and also include the, the module the models into the controller. Um, that's basically um, a few lines of code. It's not that slow. Um, but by following conventions, uh, what Rails does is it implicitly loads all these files uh, without all these like require or import or include statements. Um, which is good because it saves you like a couple of minutes writing um, these lines of code. Um, and it's also convenient when you move your, your, your file, your source code file, uh, because otherwise, like, if your require or include statements have something like um, a rel relative file path, then it will be a bit messy when you move your file structure around. Uh, then you probably need to check all the paths and make sure nothing breaks. So uh, by following conventions, um, many things happens, many, many stuff happens um, implicitly. Uh, but the problem with all these implicit or automated stuff going on is that for someone new to the framework or someone not that experienced with the framework, um, of course, then there will be trouble for uh, that inexperienced programmer, um, because in, in that case, like you won't even see, um, we, we talk about render in this lecture. Um, sometimes in the controller, you don't even see the render statement. Then you, for a beginner, then he will, he or she would probably start to wonder. So which view does this controller renders, right? Because I don't see the render statement. So, so that's the other uh, issue with convention over configuration. Uh, because many things happens implicitly for anyone that's at beginner level, anyone that's inexperienced, stuff happens like magic. <laughs> and then sometimes it's really hard to figure out what's actually going on. Um, even for some uh, like middle level developer, there can be some hidden features, um, right? Still something that's happening implicitly, but that's something about a advanced feature uh, that usually you won't work, uh, you won't use it. Uh, but let's say you're putting into a, another project where uh, the program is, is written by a very experienced seasoned real developer which uses all these implicit implicit features um, then you might hit some roadblock because you just don't see some code explicitly uh, which makes stuff can be difficult to understand um, so um, yeah so that's a few pros and cons in terms of convention over configuration um, and Rails is a framework that's really opinionated and then re really goes towards the convention side. And there are frameworks that's really over on the other side. Uh, but you can oftentimes find frameworks that's somewhere in the middle ground that does something implicitly or does something following certain convention, uh, whereas every, uh, something else is left explicit or um, allow the developer uh, or require the developer to configure. Um, all right, so uh, that's just, that's about the convention over configuration uh, and some stuff about Rails. Uh,
router and controller and view. All right, we will move on to the next video. Okay, so uh, what's the deal with route helper functions? Um, one of the nice reasons that Rails separates out routes into their own file, instead of just having them inline the way we did in Sinatra, is that it allows you to separate the way you name things from the code that handles the things. Which means that the, basically it's, it's a level of indirection for how you're mapping HTTP routes to actions in your code. In particular, here are three ways, all equivalent, that you could generate in one of your views a link that when clicked would show you the details for a particular movie. Uh, so for example, we're, we're assuming in this example that within the body of the view, by the time the view is being rendered, uh, it has access to a variable called movie. And one of the ways that we could say, OK, what is the RESTful route for showing details about a movie? Well, I've copied over the, uh, the routes for reference. You can see that the fourth line down is the show action. And we just need to construct a URI that is slash movies slash whatever the ID of the movie. OK, so here's one way to do it. Uh, we have a link. And the href is exactly this. Remember that the percent equals means evaluate this as Ruby code and substitute in the result. So this will come out to slash movies, slash whatever the ID of this movie happens to be. The user clicks on it, and a get request with that URL gets generated back to your app. Success. Another way to do the same thing uh, is, first of all, instead of actually putting the tag in, we could put in a tag called link to, which is a Ruby helper, one of many that actually generates uh, a URI for you. Um, and we'll talk about multiple reasons to use these. But in general, the reasons that, that Ruby gives you indirect or Rails gives you indirection for a lot of these things is that in production environments, you could do things like linking to images that are actually stored on a different server to speed things up. It's very cool. But for the moment, you, just can, you can take my word for it that link to is a plain old Ruby function that's part of the Rails library. The first argument is the text that's going to be what the user sees that's clickable. The second argument is the URI that's going to be generated as a result of that link. Okay, So this line of code calling link to will generate the exact same HTML as this first line where we did it kind of the hard way and by hand. But there's an even better way to do it. And it's the way that is preferred. And you'll see in all well-written Rails apps, which is the third one, which is instead of constructing the URI in place, we're calling this helper that got generated for us called movie path. Basically, for each one of these routes, there is a helper that if we add underscore path to the end of it, it'll generate the correct URL for that thing. In this case, movie path is going to generate any one of, let's see. Sorry, I got to stand back a little bit. Um, but movie path will generate which ones match as. So it's going to be any one of these, movies ID. Movie path will take one argument, and it will end up generating the same thing. Why would you use this instead of actually just kind of putting the URI in place? Because in the future, if anything changes about the way that you've chosen to name your routes or the way you've named the controller actions that correspond to them, automatically these helpers will now generate the right thing. If you didn't use it, you'd have to go through all of your code, find every place where you had manually tried to construct a route, and make sure every one of those places changed so that the, you know, instead of movies, now we call them films or something, right? Now you've got to actually go through and change every single hand generated URI as opposed to changing uh, just in the one place in routes.rb. So this is kind of an example of dry, don't repeat yourself, which says there should be only one place where a given type of information lives. In this case, the information is mapping between routes and actions. It only lives in one place, which is the routes file. And anywhere that you need to use that information, these helper methods are automatically provided for you so that you don't ever have to repeat this in multiple different files. You don't have to have multiple places where you are manually constructing a URI. There was a question. Right. So for example, here it says movie path, and there's like four different things, right? So all of these four that say as movie. It could match any of those. So how does it know which one to generate? Excellent question. Well, one part of the answer is we're trying to pass in an argument in this case. If we just called movie path without any argument, 
it would imply that the only one that it matches, actually, I think all the ones, yeah, I'm sorry, all the ones that actually match movie singular have an ID parameter that's part of the route. Where's the post? Oops, that's also a typo. So, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold on. Uh, I hate when I make typos like that that confuse people. My deepest, deepest apology. There. As I was saying, all the ones that have movie singular on the right-hand side uh, also expect an ID to be part of the route. And Rails is smart enough to, even though this thing is not an ID, this is an actual movie object, Rails will extract its ID and put it into the route for you. Okay, so that was a, that, thank you for pointing that out because it made me catch the typo. Do people understand what the question was here? That basically I'm saying movie path, but if you look at all the routes that are labeled with as movie, there's like four different ones that could match. Previously there were five, but that was a typo. There are four different ones that could match. But in fact, all of those generate the same thing, right? All of the ones that, gen that movie path with a single argument, they all end up generating the same URI. But remember that the route is not just the URI, it also includes the HTTP method. And in this case, because it's part of a link, links are always submitted with HTTP get. So in this context, the link is what gives you the get, right? The fact that it is a link and not a form submission gives you the get. The URI is going to be the same no matter which one. So you'll end up getting the same result. And you can start to see a pattern developing, right? Where in general, um, routes that have an ID in them end up having a helper with a singular name, like the path for movie number three versus the path for all movies, or to add something to the movies collection in the case of post. Uh, there was a question way in the back. Yes? Uh, if you wanted to get like, the movies index, would it be the, the movies index, would it be? You could, yes, exactly. If you wanted to get the, the movies, so what's the route helper that gives you the very top one? It is movies underscore path, movies plural. So basically, you take the thing that's after as, and you add underscore path to it, always. Similar example. If you, in fact, you are submitting a form, so now we'll do one where the route involves something like post or put. Um, again, the first example is this is how you do it manually. We're creating a route, a form, um, that we would like to have submitted. Uh, I should have used an example other than put, but that's okay. The standard way that you construct a form, as you probably know if you were working on the homework recently, is that there's an action parameter that contains the URI to which the form should submit. So again, what does that mean for the route to which the form submits? It's the HTTP method plus the URI gives you the route. So here's a route that ideally would submit using put to slash movies, um, and somewhere in the form is going to be, hopefully, a field that has the movie ID, right? Because this route, put slash movies, expects that the route will have an ID in it somewhere. But we could have the same route using these helpers, right? We could say, uh, whoop. sorry, that's the same typo as before. God, I'm a disaster with these today. I really, I'm sorry about the singular and plural typos. God, hold on. Let me just change this to be actually a little friendlier. Uh, okay. <sighs> Sorry, I, typos like this really get under my skin. I apologize. I've changed the example to be something a little more innocuous. So I've changed it to be just a regular post to slash movies. Post to slash movies is what maps to the create action. But we could also say movies path, which again, what's you know which one could this possibly match? Well, there's one two that would match movies path, and both of them end up having the same URI. So the same, same sort of pattern is at work here. Um, and again, it's the same reasoning. The route will be generated in place based on what's in the routes file. So if the routes file changes, the stuff in your views does not have to change. Um, and as we'll see, when we have resources that have relationships to each other, like the idea that a movie can have many reviews and the reviews sort of have to travel along with the movies, there are ways that you can construct RESTful routes that capture that fact. And the helper functions will, will make it easier to construct those two. So I know that this is a, usually the point where people who are first learning Rails say, why do you need all this machinery to do this relatively simple thing of establishing a standardized set of routes? The answer is because your app is going to get more complicated. 
and these helpers and the automatic mapping of uh, routes to actions and the methods that generate them for you, when the, when the app becomes just a little more complicated, it becomes much more obvious what this benefit is. So it's kind of, this is a, the stick with me part of this. And finally, uh, as you'll see when you start stepping through um, the homework that is out now, which is you don't have to write any code, but it's sort of walking you through a Rails app in detail so you can actually see all of these pieces in action. One of the pieces you'll see is that in a Rails app, you typically won't even see an explicit form tag. Instead, you'll see the use of a Rails helper called the form tag that basically says, create me a form that submits to whatever movies path is with the post method. And post with movies path is going to be a create action. And then anything in the body of that form tag is going to be all the different form fields. So quite a bit of abstraction is happening here, right? It's trying to, to prevent you from having to do a lot of things by hand. Uh, because if you generate these things automatically from the routes, you're probably less likely to make a mistake. Was there an, uh, there's, yes, a question. So what happens if you have two routes where you have the same HTTP verb and you have the same as? Um, that isn't necessarily a problem because the as is what determines, the as just determines uh, when you call a helper what URI is going to be generated, right? So if, um, but I don't, th I don't think it'll actually let you do that. I think it's an error to try to, basically you can't define routes in such a way that the mapping would be ambiguous. Um, it's always the case that any particular helper method uh, will uniquely determine the URI portion of the route. So I think what you're saying is if I had you know, get slash movies as movies, but I also had get slash movie singular as movies plural, that would actually be an error. Because then when you said movies path, there would be no way for it to tell which one you actually meant. So it's actually an error to, to define them that way. Yes? Ah, because my assumption, so the question is, uh, in this example here, which movie is the one that is being used for movie.name and movie.id? Um, I, I began the example by saying, by assumption, by the time the view is being rendered, we'll assume this variable has been set up somewhere. So the, the, variable, the value of movie is being set up somewhere in code that you don't see, but we're just assuming for the sake of this example that it corresponds to some instance of a movie resource. And we can dereference its name and its ID. OK, we good here? More questions about this? This is a little bit hard to get your head around the first time you see it, but you get used to it really fast. Um, because it's a little hard to get your head around it, uh, a few months ago, I wrote an app that helps you do that. I will show you what it is like. So in the top box, you can put anything that would legally go into routes.rb. So I'm going to, let's see, I can grab, uh, I can grab that one. And now. I can check, could I resolve that route? Yes, I could. That route would map to the movies controller, a function or an action name called index, and this route doesn't have any params embedded in it. Or if I did, let's do this one. And now I say, what happens if I have a route like get slash movies like 55? Same thing, except because this route actually does have a wildcard in it, it says that Rails would parse out ID as 55, and that would be available to you in the params hash. What if I instead said something like post slash that? What's going to happen? Doesn't match any of the route patterns, because it doesn't, right? We haven't actually specified actually any routes that use post. So this app is free and open for everybody to use, and if you're curious how it works, the code is also open. But I want to show you one more cool thing about routes that the app also handles for you. Um, and one of the things I said was, uh, if you buy into a convention over configuration rule, like this one about how routes are named, usually the, the framework side of the bargain is you get something in return for that. What you get in return for this, for deciding that you're going to do your default RESTful routes according to this pattern of naming, is I could replace those seven lines in the routes file with one line, which is that. I wanted to show you the basic manual version before showing you this, but if you say in your routes file just the one line resources movies, you are saying movies are a RESTful resource, and I want you to define the standard set of RESTful routes for create, read, update, delete, and index, 
And I want you to define the route helpers, like movies path and all that other stuff that go with them, with that one line. And again, when we talk about apps where there are multiple resources that have relationships to each other, there are corresponding route helpers that will create much more sophisticated URIs for you. And just to prove that this works, I can go back to my little Heroku demo app, and I can replace all of this with resources movies, and I can say, what happens if I say put? Like one of the default RESTful routes is put with a route that has a ID wildcard in it is the one that maps to update. And Rails will pull out the ID parameter and give it back to us in the params hash. And we can say things like, what about a route like delete? Will that work? Will it? Heads are shaking. Why didn't it work? Because delete wants an argument, right? Like which one to delete? But if we said delete, that does what we expect. OK? So the app is here. Have fun with it. It's there for you to muck around with uh, Rails routes until you sort of get the idea. So deep breath. Where are we? Um, this file called routes.rb, which we've just seen the very basic things that it can do, but it can do hella more, um, is for defining not only basic RESTful routes, but you can also define other kinds of non-RESTful, non-standard routes in there too. Among the routes that are generated are for these other actions, new and edit, which are not technically part of the standard set of RESTful actions, but in a human-facing app, you need them because they're the way to give the human the opportunity to create the data that is going to be used in the create or update. We saw that you get these nice helper functions like movie path and movies path that give you the URI part of your route. You still need to specify the HTTP method of your route. If the route is appearing inside of a link, it's always get. If it's appearing as part of a form, it can be post or put or patch or delete. And when we talk about controllers uh, in detail on Thursday, we'll see how Rails actually generates things like put, patch, and delete, even though web browsers only can do post for forms. And finally, always remember that it's the method and the URI that gives you the route. That's why it's OK for there to be a route called get slash movies and another one called post slash movies. And those are different routes. They do different things. They map to different actions. Um, this is just sort of a way of having an economy so that you don't have a lot of different names for routes when the same one would do. Okay? So that is an overview of the basic RESTful routing support in Rails. Again, if it seems like killing ants with a pile driver for doing simple stuff, it sort of is. But you will come to appreciate it in due time. Um, we haven't talked about controllers or views really at all. And that's because they're actually pretty similar to uh, how they work in Sinatra. But I do want to talk about forms, because this is something where some people get hung up uh, a little bit sooner. And I'm going to once again go back to live coding mode and really hope it works. But here's what I'm going to do. Um, we already talked about how in a human-facing app, creating or updating a resource is two interactions. Because you first need to serve a representation of the resource. Or in the case of creating, you need to serve like a blank template for creating it. Um, and I apologize that this looks like it was designed with 70s wallpaper. That's before I, I learned the ways of Bootstrap, but it's an old picture. So for example, in the case of new or edit, you need one action that retrieves the form, which is either going to be blank in the case of new or is going to have existing values in the case of edit. And then you need another action where the form gets submitted with the data, and that results in either creating or updating a record. So, the question we address here is, how do you generate and display these forms? And how do you get the values filled in by the user and do something with them? I have here my simple application with uh, one model, which is movie. You've seen that before. Um, here's my controller. There's not a whole lot going on in the controller, but we're going to focus on what happens when I try to do a new and create together. Right, so uh, this is the workflow that would correspond to, as a user, I want to create a new movie. So I first need to get the form that I fill in. Then I submit that form, and that should result in the new movie actually being created. So how do those moving parts work? So I have a controller action for new. I have a controller action for create. Do I have routes for those actions? Where would I look to find the answer to that question? routes.rb, and there's my one line, resources, movies. 
That is the magic line that gives us all of the basic CRUD actions with the names like new, create, update, delete, etc. So I do have the routes. Um, so the new action is going to have to essentially, it's going to have to display a blank form. Right? And the create action is going to somehow receive the contents of that form once it's filled out and hopefully use them to create the actual movie. So what does my view look like for that? Here's my blank form. So what are the elements of a form? First of all, where is the form going to go? Movies path. What is that? Fortunately, I can say rake routes. And I can get a listing of all of the routes defined in my routes.rb. And here they are. So if I'm doing a form, and the default mechanism for form submission is post, and if it's posting to movies path, then I should be able to figure out which of these routes uh, is going to be invoked for that form. Right? It's going to be a post, so that kind of narrows it down a lot. Um, that routes to the movies create action. Right? So that's the route that I'm going to get. And what's actually on the form? So you'll notice that I don't actually have any HTML tags here. I'm using form tag helpers, which are Rails' way of saying, hey, if you're creating a form that goes along with a particular kind of resource, I can deal with it. Because I can find out what the attributes of the, the resource are. You just tell me what kind of HTML element you want. So I'm going to have a label for the movie for the title. I'm going to have a text field where the title can be filled in. I'm going to have a select drop down menu for the rating, and those are going to be the choices in the menu. Again, do not worry about trying to parse the syntax as you go. I'm giving you a tour. This is all explored in more detail in the homework. And finally, a submit tag that will have the label save changes. So what I want to do is actually run this app and see what this looks like when it's generated as a form in the browser. So I will start the app. I will fire up a Chrome window and make it a little smaller so we can actually see other stuff. And I'm going to go where to find my app? There's a hint, port 3000, localhost 3000. And why am I going to movie slash new? Because in routes.rb, movie slash new is what triggers the new action. So here's what the form looks like. And we should be able to basically map between this, here's the HTML source. Right, I'll just skip past all the cruft. So when I said something like label movie title, Rails turned that into this nice HTML. When I said I want a text field for the movie's title, it turned it into this. Here is the thing I want you to notice about the way that Rails generates the actual HTML from my descriptions. And this is the reason that I'm using the form tag helpers instead of just hard coding HTML elements in there. Look at the weird name of this form field, movie bracket title. Why might it give a name like that? Well, I don't know. If we keep going down, here's another one. Here's my drop down menu of ratings. Its name is movie bracket rating. Kind of a weird name for an HTML element. So let me display what happens. I'm going to fill out the form. I'm going to submit the form to the create action. But I'm going to put a breakpoint in the controller so that as soon as we hit the controller action, we can stop the show and actually examine what got returned. Here's my form. I'm going to create a movie, uh, even though I chose the worst possible one. Uh, sure, whatever. Save changes. Now, before I hit save, and this is a technique that will be very valuable to you, I'm going to go back to my controller. I'm about, I think we can agree that when I submit the form, if everything goes as planned, I'm going to end up in this create action, right? So I'm going to stick by bug in there, and I'm going to stop the show. All right, so here we go. Here's my app running. I'm going to save changes. And there we are. OK? Look how cool this is. I am stopped at this point in the code. So I can actually inspect the values of all the things that I'm about to munge with. In particular, OK, params, it's a little bit hard to read, but bear with me because I want to show you something.
Look what happened here. I have an entire hash where the title is a key, the rating is a key, the release date in these weird you know, month, day, year menus is a key. In fact, I can even say this. So why is this important? I'm going to use my final three minutes to explain it. Okay? Remember when I said, uh, look at these weird names like movie bracket title, movie bracket rating, movie bracket release date, all this stuff. Rails generated those names for us. It generated them so that when params are actually parsed out, everything on the form comes out as a single hash. The keys of that hash are the attributes of a movie. The value for each key is the thing that the user filled in on the form. Why is that a really, really useful representation? Because when you call new or create, what do you pass? You pass a hash of attributes and values. So basically, when I use those form tag helpers, the params I receive are essentially ready to be passed directly to create or directly to update attributes. I don't have to do any additional work. I do not have to manually construct a hash of things to pass because the names of the forms on the web page have been constructed in such a way that params has that hash automatically. So if I now step to the next line, let's make the window narrower again. It created the movie. There was no error or I would have seen an exception. And in fact, if I print the movie now, I can see that it has acquired an ID. So this really worked. And the last thing I'm going to do is do I render a view? Well, if I just created something, it's not clear what view it makes sense to render, but it would be reasonable to go back to the listing of all movies, and then the user could see that the movie they just created is actually there, which is why the last thing in my controller action is just a redirect back to the index. And if I let the program run, and I go back to my web browser, there it is at the end, and it has all worked. Again, there were a lot of details in here, and the point was not to absorb all the details. It is to see the tour and understand what Rails is trying to do. In the common case, the form is there for you to make some changes to a resource. Therefore, Rails will generate that form in such a way that the names of the form elements arrive in the params hash ready to be used with all of the active record calls. There'll be active record practice exercises. Homework 4 has a lot more detail on this. I realize it is a lot to absorb, but you're all doing really well, so stick with me and have a great weekend. Try to stay dry. All right, that's the second video. Basically, a bit more about the router, um, controller, and view. Um, all right, let's get to the last video for today. <laughs>Okay, so uh, before we start on today's material, uh, I'm going to just uh, use an example of some code that somebody had put up or might be raised under these conditions, but it wasn't working right. Um, if this is your code, I I'm, I'm hope I have your permission to use it. You're safely anonymous. Uh, I only wanted to put this up here so we could sort of do a little kind of groupthink exercise. If this was your code and you were trying to, under the correct circumstances, raise argument error and it wasn't being raised, what are some strategies for debugging that you might try to sort of isolate the problem? What are some things that could go wrong here, and how might you try to uh, modify the code to fix them? So, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first thing you would do is try some inputs. Uh, so to make that simpler, I, I took the liberty of deciding to wrap this up in a function. Uh, so this way, we could just call the function with the inputs. And by the way, this is kind of a standard trick, right? If you've got a piece of code in the middle of a function and that piece of code seems to be at fault, pull it out into its own function and make the inputs and outputs of that function explicit. And when we talk about beautiful code and refactoring later, uh, one of the things you'll see is that actually short functions are your friend for all kinds of reasons. But one reason is short functions are easy to test. OK, so we'll wrap it up. We'll put some stuff in it. But let's assume we do that and it's still not working. What are, what are sort of, you know, in terms of the scientific method, how would you start to narrow down the possible problem? Assuming that the symptom is we're expecting that argument error would be raised, but it's not being raised when we call it with a character that we think should raise it. What could we try to l eliminate out? How can we simplify? Yes, sir. OK, so one thing is you, you, we've got an if here that's got three conditions. And if this is not happening, 
then it's reasonable to assume that all three conditions are false. The question is, what, you know, if you test each of the conditions separately, what could you learn from that? Maybe one of the three clauses is not doing the right thing. So that's a thing you could do. What else could you do? Yes? Yes, so aggressively parenthesize, right? This Boolean expression appears to want to say, if it's not the case that the character matches this regular expression. However, um, depending on, you know, if you look in the Ruby documentation, there's this question of, uh, do the parentheses imply going around this whole thing, or do they enclose the bang as well? In other, or in the language of programming systems people, how tightly does the bang character, the exclamation mark, bind compared to how tightly this comparison character binds. Now, it's already the case, by the way. What's the thing I'm going to say next? That if you have to look it up in the documentation, if you have to look it up at this point, you probably should have parenthesized it anyway. Right? So there, there was this example I gave earlier on during the first week about it's possible to make code so concise that when you read it, you're actually not 100% sure how it works. And then you have to go check the documentation to make sure you understood it. This might be one of those examples where even if it turns out that the precedence of bang and matching regular expressions are, are uh, what we would expect for this code, the fact that we have to think about it during debugging suggests that we should put the parentheses in anyway. The fact that we had to think about it is like that's already too much work for the programmer. So this is a case where putting the parentheses back in would possibly help debug it if that was the problem. But even if that's not the problem, it'll probably make the code more readable for the next person. Any other suggestions? Other suggestions? Notice I stuck by bug in there. Um, if you were in my head, which you don't want to be, but if you were in my head and I, what do you think I'm about to do? Once I run this code, it hits by bug, it drops me into the debugger. What do you think I'm going to be typing in that debugger? As a way of, uh, yes, go ahead. OK, so I, one thing I could type in the debugger is let's take a look at the value of char. Let's see if it's what I expect. And OK, let's say it's what I expect. What's another thing I would type into the debugger? Here's a hint. It's on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if I'm about to evaluate char against these three clauses, I could manually enter each one of those clauses into the debugger and see if the debugger says that it's true or false. So if there's a problem in how I express one of these clauses, one way to do it is manually evaluating each of those expressions at the moment in time right before the program would have done it. Right? So this is kind of you narrow, narrow, narrow down. And at some point, you will figure out what the problem was. By the way, uh, if you're in here and this was your code, did you ever figure out what the problem is? Because when I ran this code, it actually did the right thing. <laughs> is the owner of this code willing to identify themselves? I, I, I scraped it off of Piazza, and I honestly don't remember whose it was. But OK, well, whatever. I, it seemed to work for me, so maybe there was something else going on. But I just wanted to sort of you know, get everybody in the habit of adversarially, what could you do? Right? Think, think of it as, as you're, you're trying to sort of match wits with the interpreter. And how much can you sort of fine tune and narrow in on what the problem might be? That's kind of that's the debugging mentality. A couple of things, based on sort of reading Piazza posts and also my interactions during uh, office hours with various people and talking to the GSIs about their office hours, um, let me just repeat a piece of advice that, that I've been giving. And I, there's sort of, uh, I can't say it too many times. And I, I call it knowing what you don't know. Um, a technical colleague of mine used to have the saying that problems that seem to kind of go away by themselves tend to come back and bring their friends. So uh, the way this applies to the work in this class is if you're having trouble getting something to work like in your code, it's great to you know, Google, use Stack Overflow and stuff to figure out what might be going on. However, even if the Stack Overflow post or whatever says, to fix it, do this, don't do that. First, understand what's broken. Um, if you apply a fix, even if the fix seems to work, if you didn't really understand what was broken in the first place, um, it's not clear that you've really applied the fix. You certainly haven't had the experience of fixing the bug. So you could argue that although the code maybe seems to do the right thing now, you don't really understand why it's doing the right thing. And therefore, I claim, you don't really understand if it's doing the right thing. So it's great to use the internet as a resource, but don't use it blindly. Right? The, make sure that before you apply any fix, before you change a single line of code in trying to fix a bug, Make sure you understand why you're making the change. What is the, the hypothesis you're trying to test about why that specific change might actually make an improvement? Uh, another version of this that I've seen is weeks of coding and debugging can save you hours of thinking. Um, and yes, you read that right. Uh, I, I've seen comments from people saying, you know, I, I feel like I spend more time 
looking up stuff on the internet and trying to figure out how something works than writing lines of code. And that's probably true. That's actually not that unusual. In fact, I think ironically, when you use a really powerful high-level framework, and you know, Rails is an example, but if you, if you move towards using React or Angular or Backbone, you're going to have a lot of the same experience. The frameworks do a whole lot in order to save you a bunch of grunge work. But that means that by definition, you're going to write less code for an app that accomplishes uh, the same amount of things. So it's going to feel like you're not writing a lot of code. You might only write three lines. But if you think about how those three lines leverage what the framework is doing for you, those three lines actually are accomplishing a lot. So don't think of it in terms of how many lines of code have you written. Um, think of it in terms of how much new functionality have you managed to get to work. And it's kind of the partnership between you and the framework, which requires you to understand what the framework is doing. And yes, that takes a lot of time. And there's sort of no shortcut around that. But as you get more comfortable with any framework, you'll get to where you'll spend less time looking stuff up because you'll remember how you did it the last time. Right? It, just, it takes a while to get into that groove. And that's true of every framework you'll ever use. All right, so that's the last video of the day. Um, before we get to the practice session, uh, I do want to bring up something. So if you actually go to the edX course, uh, there's some extra reading materials uh, for this module, which I think is really helpful. Um, so um, to access that, um, just go to the edX course, expand that module four uh, menu, and you should see 4.9 and 4.10. So these two materials, reading materials, uh, first one covers some common pitfalls uh, for using Ruby on Rails. And actually some of the ideas behind it are also applicable for other uh, frameworks. Um, so here I won't read, spend time reading it. Um, so either after the course, uh, after this lesson, you can uh, go look it up yourself, um, or if you're watching the video uh, recording later, you could pause the video right here and read through the material. Right, I'll just spend a few seconds, scroll through this one. Okay, so that's the first reading material. Um, and I do want to mention that um, here it brings up a common question like so for a new project should I use this framework or that framework um, and one way uh, we could do that is just use whatever you're already good at or familiar with it which is also kind of one of the recommendations here in this reading material um, basically, because every framework um, offers a lot of a lot of stuff, um, you know, a lot of stuff happening and automated in the background, so it usually it takes quite some effort to fully understand the framework. Um, and if then uh, you're using a framework um, it, that you are not familiar with most likely you will run into some bugs or some problems that's are usually fine for like prototype project experimental projects or personal projects um, but if you're um, working in a company or a ministry and doing something uh, for a production application that's publicly available and need to be like quality software um, that's user facing, then most likely it might be a better idea to just use one of the framework you are already familiar with, um, if you have the choice. So sometimes you don't have, right? Sometimes your supervisor would decide it. Sometimes you just 
you are just the next person for someone else's work, uh, then in, in those cases, uh, you don't even need to think about that. Um, although that being said, it kind of contradicts what we actually already <laughs> mentioned earlier, where it's advisable um, to keep learning new tools, new frameworks, because um, technology keeps changing and sometimes new tools offer new features and that's way more powerful than the existing ones. Um, so basically my advice would be um, if it's production uh, or user-facing application that you're working on, um, probably uh, you should lean toward using a framework that you're already familiar with. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to try everything and honestly um, we learn uh, by doing and we learn by going through trials and errors right so and then if there's a safe playground for you to try some frameworks um, that's that is that would be great um, and sometimes honestly um, there are uh, user facing projects that doesn't really matter that much um, more and more of like experimental sen side of thing um, then in, I will say also you could use those opportunities to try new frameworks and test it out um, but yeah basically um, it's very common to have this question should I use this framework or that framework for this project that I'm uh, building and there's not really a right or wrong answer um, but um, basically I would say for essential applications uh, try stick with what you already know otherwise feel free to explore uh, new for new stuff and then if for production or user facing or critical application you decide to use some new framework that you are not familiar with, um, you got to have a really good reason for that. Uh, one example would be like if you're building a non conventional web application, like a web based online game, I've mentioned a couple of times, then, like, then in that case, it's pretty clear a framework like Rails won't fit the purpose then you, uh, it might, in that case, it might be a good reason um, to use some new framework um, that hopefully would be a better fit uh, for the application. All right, anyway, that's the first reading material. Uh, I really recommend everybody to take some time uh, to read that. And the other reading material, 4.10, Um, it talks about uh, some of the characters of Rails as a framework. Um, again, I will just scroll through it. Uh, feel free to uh, pause it uh, if you're watching the recording. So that's about the reading materials. Um, it's optional if you don't want to spend time or if you're too busy, it's okay to skip it. Um, all right, then let's get to, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, that's everything I want to say. Now let's get to the practice session. Uh, we have about 40 minutes left. Um, oh then, actually, before, before that, uh, homework for week three. Uh, so in Populi, you should be able to see these uh, two framework options. Again, if you don't really want to spend that much time um, in hands-on uh, programming, uh, you have the option, the basic homework option, 
uh, to write a summary and for week three you will be reading uh, the third chapter chapter three of the textbook um, and the third chapter is uh, about the SaaS architecture microservices SLA API and RESTful um, So that's the basic homework option. And if you uh, want to go with the bonus option uh, for this week, that's going to be uh, two chip practices. Uh, I do want to emphasize here that uh, not like week two, where for the bonus option, we actually had two options where you could either do the code walls or the uh, Ruby intro chips. Uh, for week three, we are actually going to do both. So if you choose to do the bonus option, the bonus option for homework, uh, you will have to do uh, both chips practices. Um, although it has different focus, so if you click the link, uh, you will see the first get repo, a okay, GitHub repo. And the first practice is uh, about active record, uh, basically using active record to retrieve uh, all kinds of data uh, and then mani mani manipulate the data in the database. Um, and then the second practice is more of a uh, code reading comprehension uh, where you don't actually need to write any code um, but you will need to read through the code and answer a couple of questions uh, okay so uh, let me close that so that's about homework uh, for week three uh, again to repeat it uh, the basic option uh, read and write a summary for chapter three or the bonus option uh, to complete both uh, coding practice. Okay, um, so then uh, I will show how to, uh, next I will show how to set up uh, these two repos on your local environment. Um, so click the link, get to the GitHub page, fork it, always fork it. I've already forked it, so uh, this is my own fork. Uh, let me get my terminal show up here. The terminal. terminal. All right. Hopefully you can see that. So again, first step, clone it to somewhere on the computer. Uh, I already did it, uh, let me remove it. Clone it. So um, there's already like um, a documentation about how to set up. Uh, Basically, follow this step. The first fork and fork the repo and clone it, and then the second re uh, step would be run bundle install or just bundle. Uh, sorry, cd first. Active record practice. And bundle install. Since so already installed it. Uh, and it immediately returns. For you, it may take uh, a few seconds or a minute uh, for it to install all the dependencies. And then um, there's a optional but su suggested step. Uh, let me see if it, oh, it, cover, it got covered up. Yep. That's better. Okay. So an optional st step uh, to backup your uh, local database uh, 
this is SQL, uh, this practice is using SQLite. Uh, it's basically a light database uh, that's compatible with SQL. Um, and then all the data basically lives in this SQLite 3 file. Um, so um, here it's recommending you to uh, save a copy of it. Um, but I will say it's not really necessary um, because you have Git. So you could always just roll, roll back. Uh, let me actually do something. So let's, uh, so for example, here I just remove file. Let's say it's really messed up and then uh, put some random data. Um, actually, just create an empty file. So let's say I just wiped out the entire database. Uh, so then if you test it, it will always fail and you won't be able to finish uh, the practice this way. Uh, so let's say somehow you did something wrong and then the database gets really messed up. What you, you could actually just do to roll it back is, use, is to use git. You could do git checkout dash dash and the file name, which is the SQLite file. Check it out. And it's then rolled back. So with Git, you actually don't have to save a copy of that file, um, although it's suggested here. Uh, so I would say just skip it and then uh, use Git if something goes wrong. However, uh, if you're not familiar with Git yet, it might still be a good idea to save a copy of the, the database file. All right. So now uh, it's set up. Um, there is some background information, uh, basically about talks you through the um, data schema. Uh, in, and in this practice, uh, we basically have a customer table and ha it has these fields and blah, 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 blah. All right, and then to actually do the practice, what you would do is run RSpec, uh, just like what you would do for the first practice or the last week's practice uh, for Ruby intro. Uh, you run RSpec to run the unit tests that's already written in there, and you try to pass all pass all these uh, tests. So. Um, in this practice though, all, all the test cases would be disabled or skipped um, at the beginning. So uh, if you look at the test results, everything is in yellow. So nothing failed actually. Um, and if you check the status, it says there are total 13 test cases, zero failed, 13 pending. So all of those are pending or skipped. Um, so what you will want to do is to uh, let me open my editor. Let me grab that. Into the live stream. So I loaded up the uh, practice project folder to my text editor. Uh, what you will see is under the spec folder, there is a uh, active record practice spec file. And here is all the test cases. And if you look at it, uh, you will see uh, every test case starts with a X specified. So to actually activate or to enable 
uh, one of the test case. What we will do is delete the, the x uh, before uh, at the beginning. So now it should say specify blah 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 blah, and it runs the test case. So now if I go back and run our spec, now I get a failure uh, because instead of uh, a skipped or a pending test case, I have a actually working test case. And then to finish the practice, I uh, basically read through the test case, uh, understand what it tries to tries to ask you to solve, and then uh, implement it. So you would write your code in this library folder, active record practice uh, file. So for the first two test cases, the method has already been created. Uh, all you needed to do is to uh, implement it. Uh, you probably need to refer to the active record uh, documentation uh, to understand how to use it. Uh, we've already watched a few videos uh, that kind of give you a overview uh, about how active record works. Uh, but for the details, I would practice this way. Uh, and another thing that I want to bring to your attention is how we define the methods here. Because uh, it's really easy to miss it. <laughs> um, so, so if you look at it here, every, every, the, um, every one of these methods start with uh, self dot, except for this uh, to strain method. So uh, let's say um, you finish the first two practices and then you want to do the third one which asks for a with dot org email method. And then if you add that it, uh, add the method here this way, uh, which Sometimes you would just do that, copy and paste it, and define the method name and end it, and then start to write some stuff here. Um, you will see it fail. Uh, the reason is that it's actually expecting a class method instead of a instant method. And in order to implement a um, class method, you actually need to add the self dot before the method name. So remember to always add self dots uh, in this practice. So uh, because the class method and an instant method is two different thing, um, and most in most cases you would just implement instant method. But because uh, the practice is programmed this way, for this practice always remember to add this self dot before your method name. Otherwise, it will fail, and it's uh, really easy to forget it. All right, so that's what I want to bring to your attention. Um, otherwise, just uh, follow through these test cases. Um, try to solve it one by one. Don't do it all at once, because uh, in that case, you will see a lot of failed test cases, and it might be hairy to. <laughs> to find which one is what. Okay, so that would be the first practice, uh, which is about active record. And that was actually for the uh, lecture uh, last week. Um, and then for the lecture today, the practice is this, this one, the second one. Um, so that's uh, homework, rails, word guesser, or it's actually just the hand person or hand man game uh, implemented in rails. Um, so for this one, what you will need to do, uh, although all that you really need to do is just read through the code and try to answer the questions here, starting from section two. So you will need to answer question 2.1, 2.2, all the way to 4.4. Uh, for, actually, oh, let me hide my editor. 
Right. Uh, that is okay. So sorry. Um, that was covered. Uh, let me just repeat it again. For this practice, all you really need to do is to answer the question from section two. So that's Q 2.1, 2.2, all the way to 4.4. And uh, for section five, it's not really required uh, because later when we talk about BDD or behavior driven development, we will come back and talk about cucumber. Um, but if you want to challenge yourself, um, you could try um, the few questions under section five, but it's not required. All you need to answer is uh, from section two to all the way to section four. Um, so what you will need to do is update the readme file. Um, this stuff is in readme file. Edit it and type your answer to these questions and push it back to GitHub. Okay. Um, although uh, you might want to actually run this application and test it out. Um, so to do that, again, fork it. I've already forked it. And let me get my terminal. Clone the code. Again, I already cloned it, so I'm removing it. Clone it again. Now I have the code here on my computer. CD to change directory in there. And run bundle or bundle install to install the dependencies. Let's see. There's a typo. Again, because I have already installed it, so it's returning immediately, otherwise it might may take some time. Okay. And to start the server or start the application, run bing slash rails server. Um, although if you look at the documentation, it actually says uh, just Rails server, um, but my advice is to always prepare it. Uh, yeah, prepare it with being slash. Uh, same idea as what we've uh, looked at in the previous videos, where it says to prepare the command with bundle execute Rails says. Um, sometimes. Uh, Actually, not sometimes. It's always annoying to you know have to type like ten more characters before every single command. Um, but it's uh, really needed to ensure that you always get the right version of uh, Rails or Rake or whatever command you're using. Um, otherwise, it might break your application. Um, so then with bing slash rails, it kind of does the same thing as bundle execute. Uh, that will ensure this command will use the correct version that's specified um, in gem file. Uh, it just a few less characters you have to type. So I always prefer to do this one. Um, so just run bing rails server, it will start uh, the application and um, you can open it so if you click the link um, you will be able to open the application um, in your browser it's basically a hand man or hand person game uh, click start a new game um, you know let's guess the word let's see. So 
will just you can play with it um, and that kind of gives you a feel of how this application works in terms of um, its feature and how a user would actually experience um, this web application um, and then you could actually uh, like insert by bug into the code and see exactly um, how it behaves uh, and, but ultimately what you're asked to do in this practice is to answer these questions although it will require you to uh, read and understand part of this code uh, and then in the process of that you might want to actually run the code and then pause it by inserting a by bug and uh, dive deeper and into the code behavior. All right, so hopefully I've made myself clear. Um, so that's the practice we're going to do for this week and for the remaining 20 minutes of today's um, lesson. Um, so, okay, uh, I think I've, I've talked enough. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment or send me some message in the chat room. Uh, otherwise, I will be creating a Google Meet um, and then we will uh, have the practice session over there. Although it's just gonna be 20 minutes. And we will still have that um, and then I will be open uh, for questions over there. All right, so I'll end the live stream and see you in the uh, Google Meet.